Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it is great to see so many of you out there, uh, some of your faces, some of your names, um, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Mike Wakeford. I'm executive director of Muse Winston-Salem, the Museum of Understanding, Storytelling, and Engagement. We are a community history museum, formerly known as New Winston Museum. We are currently located at 226 South Liberty uh, in a building just behind Willow's Bistro in the old depot building. Um, we are currently at work um, uh, on planning a renovation and reopening uh, that will happen um, uh, sometime in the next uh, two years, but we uh, have an ever stop programming and we are delighted to be here uh, this evening on Zoom to be joined by so many of you. This is a really special evening. Um, this is the first event, as you know, uh, of the community read of Beyond Innocence, The Life Sentence of Daryl Hunt, a brand new book by uh, Phoebe Zerwick, a former uh, journalist with the Winston-Salem Journal, now faculty at Wake Forest University, who has um, just gifted this community a uh, remarkable um, new uh, portrait of um, the life and times of Daryl Hunt. Um, the Daryl Hunt story, uh, I will not say much about now because our panelists tonight uh, will will do that, uh, but I, I will just uh, begin by saying how honored we are to be part of um, uh, reintroducing uh, to, for, for some uh, a, a first introduction of uh, the story of Daryl Hunt to this community. Um, Daryl Hunt's um, it, life and uh, life and um, his experience with injustice um, uh, has has long been now part of this community's reckoning with its uh, with its racial past and um, the continuation of injustices that this community uh, continues to um, to seek to address. And um, we are honored to be part of uh, part of bringing his story to you tonight and in the weeks ahead. Uh, before I go any further, I want to um, I do want to thank um, our sponsors and partners uh, in this community read um, this the uh, our ability to um, distribute uh, copies of the book uh, to many of you would not be possible without uh, the sponsorship of the Wake Forest uh, Wake Forest Humanities Inst Institute with support by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, we are also partnering with the Forsyth County Public Library, Aperture Cinema, Bookmarks, the Wake Forest Department of History, um, and we are grateful for all of their um, support in helping make this happen. I'm going to very quickly uh, do a, a screen share and, um, and so everybody can see the flyer um, for the series ahead. Um, most of you are familiar with this already, but here we are for the first event, March 31st. On April Thursday, April 14th, again on Zoom, we will be joined by uh, Dr. T. Dion Bailey of Colgate University and Tara Callahan from the Conservatives for the organization known as Conservatives for Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, that event is co-sponsored by the Wake Forest University Department of History. And I guess I would say this: if tonight's um, if tonight's program is specifically um, uh, sort of uh, gravitates around uh, three figures who uh, were uh, uh, were important parts of um, Daryl Hunt's uh, journey. Um, the event uh, on uh, Thursday, April fourteenth, um, is uh, an, is a is a panel that where we hope to um, open up uh, some broader discussion about some of the important issues around um, around reentry uh, the and the. Uh, the aftermath of, 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 of false incarceration um, and uh, look at that through both an academic and advocacy uh, lens. On the 19th, uh, on Tuesday, April 19th at 6.30 p.m., we'll be doing a screening of the 2006 film, The Trials of Daryl Hunt at Aperture Cinema. That'll be followed by an audience talkback moderated by the Winston-Salem Journal's uh, Michael Hewlett. And then on Sunday, April 24th, in person at 4 p.m. at Central Library, there will be a discussion uh, with the author, with Phoebe Zerwick, hosted by Shannon Dale Page, Outreach, Diversity and Inclusion Manager at the Forsyth County Public Library. So we invite you to join us for all of those, um, all of those events. I'm going to stop sharing again. And um, and I will say that if, if Alana, if my colleague Alana from the museum, well, she's beat me to it, you already put a link in the chat bar. If you would like to uh, reserve a free ticket for that, screen, that special screening of the trials of Daryl Hunt, you can 
uh, follow that link now or later and, uh, and secure your seat there for that special evening. Um, so let me, just a quick note about the structure uh, of this evening so you'll know what to expect. Uh, I'm about to get out of the way and hand um, over the moderating role to, um, uh, uh, to Rob Stevens. Uh, and I'll introduce uh, him in a minute. He then will introduce the other panelists. Um, and what will follow then will be, it's 7.07 .07 now. So I promise to stop talking at, by about 7.09 uh, and Rob will take over. And for the, for the next 45 to 50 minutes, um, we will uh, enjoy a discussion uh, between uh, our, three, our three panelists moderated by Reverend Stevens. Um, and then at some point as eight o'clock approaches, we will move to um, Q and A. And the way we're going to uh, the way we're going to handle Q and A is we invite you to throughout the evening um, use the chat uh, function um, on Zoom to um, ask questions uh, or pose questions. We will, uh, my colleague and I, will uh, be curating those questions and collect collecting them. And at the right time. Um, I'll return to the scene and voice those uh, voice some of those questions. I'm sure we won't be able to get to all of them um, for our panelists to uh, respond to. So you, you don't need to wait until any appointed time to ask questions. If they go into the chat bar, uh, I'm not going anywhere and we will we will get them and collect them and ask uh, as many as we can. So um, and then we the evening will come to a close no later than 830. So you can you can know that um, we won't keep you all night, but I'm sure we'll leave um, with more to more to think about and more questions to ask. And perhaps at, at later uh, events in the series, we will get to those. Um, feel free to leave your cameras on. I always like to see uh, your your faces, but also you're obviously also um, uh, uh, absolutely um, able to turn them off off if you want. Um, and with that, I am going to uh, introduce, uh, introduce our moderator for the evening. And I should say right up front that our moderator is a participant as well in this, uh, in this panel. Um, I am honored to introduce the Reverend Rob Stevens. Um, Rob serves as Chief of, Staff, uh, uh, Chief of Staff for Repairers of the Breach and Deputy Director for the June 18th Mass Poor Peoples and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington for the Poor Peoples Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Rob has also served as a trainer and organizer with the Racial Equity Institute since 2018 and, it's, and is ordained in the United Church of Christ. From 2016 to 2019, Rob served as an associate minister at Middle Collegiate Church in New York City after graduating from Union, Union Theological Seminary. Prior to moving to New York for seminar, seminary, he worked with the North Carolina NAACP and was an organizer of the Moral Monday Forward Together movement. Rob began his work with the NAACP alongside Daryl when they were hired together in 2010 or Daryl Hunt, I, I should say, when they were hired together in 2010 to start the Anti-Death Penalty Project. Raised in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in high school, Rob joined Delabrook Presbyterian Church under the leadership of the late Reverend Dr. Carlton A.G. Eversley, where he was first introduced to Daryl Hunt. So welcome, Rob. Thank you for being here, and um, the, you take over from here. Great, thank you so much, Mike and Alana and the uh, museum for putting this together and for uh, thinking of me. Um, it uh, is uh, an incredible honor to be uh, speaking with uh, these two, uh, I, I can call them gentlemen, I guess, but uh, uh, not always gentle, but uh, these, these two uh, prophetic leaders in our community. Um, I have the spiritual gift of ADD, so I'm gonna try not to look at all these boxes. Uh, but I do see Ms. Winnikoff. Is that my third grade teacher, Mrs. Winnikoff? Oh, my goodness. That's wonderful. Um, I still feel bad about not turning in a project from there. Uh, but uh, so, uh, you know, one, one theme as I was talking to uh, my partner about tonight um, is that uh, come up even just reading the book. And do I give uh, thanks to Phoebe uh, for her work? Uh, on this. Uh, reading this book has been um, a powerful experience to go through it again. Uh, it's, um, you know, I, I think anyone moving to Winston-Salem needs to read it, on, you know, to, to get underneath this and certainly can't understand Winston-Salem, North Carolina without this story of uh, Daryl uh, Hunt. So 
uh, certainly uh, appreciation for even bringing us here today. Um, I, uh, and also of course my parents who are on, uh, I see the Stevens who are on, uh, who uh, drove me across town before I was able to drive myself and then uh, jumped in uh, plenty of buses and uh, vans with me to go uh, with Reverend Mendez to protest. Um, but uh, so I want to first uh, introduce, for those who don't know, um, Dr. Mendez and attorney Mark uh, Rabel. Uh, I'm going to read uh, attorney Rabel's. Uh, he's, uh, of course, at Wake Forest University School of Law as a professor. He's been director of the Innocence and Justice Clinic since 2009. Um, from 2003 to 2013, he was an assistant capital defender in North Carolina and, uh, and served uh, as a supervising attorney for the lit litigation clinic at Wake Forest from 83 to 2013, and an adjunct professor of trial advocacy uh, from 2003 to 2013. 2004, the North Carolina Academy Trial Lawyers awarded Rabel the Thurgood Marshall Award for his uh, work representing Daryl Hunt. And I, I really appreciate in the book, uh, the, uh, you probably didn't appreciate at the time, but being called Don Quixote uh, by, the, by the folks, but that was um, you know, probably a, not, a, not a compliment at the time, but it, uh, he has been a, a, a warrior for this and has been uh, certainly uh, one of the first white people uh, who uh, I could see as a young person uh, fighting racism. And uh, you know that uh, certainly uh, has stuck with me uh, for a long time. Uh, Dr. Mendez uh, uh, has a great uh, biography. He was, of course, the pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, uh, icon in a, of the movement in Winston-Salem. Uh, my pastor, uh, Dr. Eversley, would often call Reverend Mendez the MLK of Winston-Salem. And that's not hyperbole and, uh, and is not a historical. Sometimes you hear people use that, but he was uh, using it uh, very specifically and uh, accurately as uh, a moral uh, conscience uh, for Winston-Salem, um, who, uh, whose interest uh, and expertise is always fascinating. I never leave a conversation with Dr. Mendez without learning something new. Uh, he was, of course, one of the founders in the, uh, of the Daryl Hunt Defense Committee. Uh, he was a graduate of Shaw University uh, in, here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I now live, and uh, was uh, a leader in uh, many uh, movements. Certainly, uh, you, you'll see him mentioned in Tim Tyson's book uh, as a leader in the Oxford movement um, uh, with uh, Dr. Chavis and uh, you know, plenty of other books he just, he'll pop up uh, in terms of uh, his role, um, both from the Black Power movement to labor organizing, civil rights and community, um, and is uh, just a, a mentor and a, a friend uh, as well. And so uh, what I want to start with is uh, what we know about this system and what gets reiterated in Phoebe's book is, is the, the multiple deaths or the multiple harms uh, that the system inflicted on both Daryl uh, and the people around him uh, that it is a, a system that, you know, kills you on the inside while you're in the system and then keeps on that once you leave the, you know, the physical boundaries of uh, uh, being incarcerated, uh, you know, those, uh, the, the experience continues to harm. Um, and uh, what we'll be talking about today around trauma and, and dehumanization. So in that light, I, I was hoping we could uh, start with uh, a bit about Daryl and uh, each of our experiences of Daryl uh, as a human, as a person, as a friend, as a mentee, uh, Dr. Mendez, as a client, you know, uh, someone who, full, who filled so many different roles um, and, you know, was a full human being and, uh, that we, we knew. And so, uh, uh, Rev. Mendez, maybe you could start with your kind of beginning of how you came to the uh, to know about Daryl Hunt and to, to uh, become his, one of his mentors and supporters. If you could take us back to the uh, early 80s when, when that began. Okay, first of all, um, I wanna say to uh, Phoebe, thank you uh, for this uh, very important, informative and historical book uh, that you wrote. You once uh, mentioned whether or not you had done justice, I think you did. 
and um, I'm deeply appreciative uh, for your work and I'm appreciative for this forum this, this evening um, because uh, more than just Daryl, but this whole era really needs to be um, remembered and studied and uh, uh, constantly raised because so much of what happened to Daryl is still happening today. And, um, and I want to say, Mark, it's good to see you. But um, after I, I started reading the book, I found myself grieving again and realized that those of us who worked so long and hard with Daryl suffers from suffer from PTSD as well. Uh, and um, I find myself grieving and even at points crying, uh, just reliving uh, those experiences again. And I guess, Mark, I'm trying to figure out why Tisdale and that whole group that framed Daryl in the very beginning are not in prison because it was straight up a legal lynching of what happened to him. But maybe we'll come back to that. Um, but I had just come to Winston-Salem in 1983. I was still in my honeymoon. Um, I knew Larry Little uh, from uh, the Black Power Movement and other uh, movements and a few other people here in Winston. Um, I came to Pastor Emmanuel Baptist Church. And um, when this happened, uh, when this whole event unfolded, uh, I did not know Daryl. I had never... Uh, uh, heard of Daryl, in fact, but um, it was a horrific um, murder that took place. And uh, Larry Little um, convinced me that Daryl was innocent, that he was not the one uh, who had killed uh, Deborah Sykes. And um, I believed him. And then when I met Daryl, I was even further convinced that he was not the one because Daryl did not appear to even have a violent bone in his body. Um, and so um, I got involved. Um, I came with a history of involvement, civil rights, black power movement, pan-African movement, et cetera. And um, it, it, was, it was a no brainer um, after I started looking at the facts listening uh, to Larry. And I realized, man, because I had seen it before, it was not the first time, um, but I felt like I had to get involved. I needed to get involved because I, I, I brought a lot of experience with me to Winston-Salem, but I also realized that made targets out of all of us. But working with um, uh, Iman Briggs, who's not on, uh, tonight, um, and um, Daryl, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Eversley, who um, has passed all too early, too soon, and um, others, uh, but um, this was an experience uh, that will no doubt uh, be a part of my life forever. Mm. Thank you, Reverend Mendez. We'll definitely come back to kind of that impact in that period too um, uh, on Winston-Salem and the country. Uh, but Mark, um, you tell, bring us into your introduction to Daryl and any, of course, any other reflections uh, you want to start with? Yeah, thank you, Rob. It's good to see everybody. Um, I knew Rob since before you were Rob, I guess. <laughs> seeing as how your dad chad is on here we went to school together hey chad um so yeah there's a lot of people on. i mean i'd like to stop and talk to everybody that i see on there <laughs> i see heads nodding and uh people that we've uh, intersected with that daryl and i spoke to different 
places as far away as Colgate, UNCG, Wake Forest. I see Gordon Jenkins is on here, my co-counsel. Um, so that Gordon, Gordon and I actually knew Daryl somewhat before all this. Uh, strangely, um, Daryl would come to our law firm because uh, Ken Babb was the public administrator and he was, he was the administrator of a small amount of money for Daryl and his siblings. It's something like $10,000 that his grandfather had left for each of them. And every once in a while, maybe even weekly, Daryl would come by and get, and get some money. He used that money and this was, I mean, this just tells everything about Daryl. He didn't use that money for himself. He basically cashed that out and bought all this furniture and everything for an apartment for a young lady he was seeing who had just had a baby. And he basically took, took them on as his family, uh, his initial family. And um, so that, to me, that was who Daryl was before all this. And it was, um, he was always a very great quiet guy. Um, I mean, didn't really draw any attention there were some people that came to the law firm that drew attention, but not Daryl. And so when he got charged with this, it was really shocking, you know, because initially, like everybody, even even criminal defense lawyers believe that people must have done something to get charged, you know. And we, you know, we we thought that too, because uh, most people that we were appointed to represent had done something. And that, of course, that's false, as I now know, 40 years later. You know, as to maybe 20% of the people, they're not even guilty of anything or they're guilty of something lesser. So uh, the court appointed Gordon. Gordon asked me to get involved and was able to get the judge to appoint me as well. And I would say when I went down to see Daryl, it was really the first conversation that I ever had with him. I mean, I, I had seen him in the law firm, but no interactions. But in this first hour of talking to him, I found him to be very calm and very gentle, very willing to answer whatever question came up. And I, we pretty much got right into talking about, you know, where he was, very specific about where he was, what he did, what he was wearing. And to me, it was almost bizarre that he could remember the morning of August 10th, 1984 in great detail where he slept, um, that they, that he woke up in time to watch the Beverly Hillbillies that he watched every morning at eight o'clock, which I just, you know, maybe this is sort of racist of me, but I, I thought it funny, you know, that this young black kid, 19 years old would wake up literally in a drink house and turn on the Beverly Hillbillies, but he would watch that. And so that very morning, as soon as that was over, he and Sammy left because Sammy had a, he had a case in court and he told me things like on the way to court, they stopped and got a beer at, at a place on the way, you know, the, where they could get a beer. I mean, you, you, he told the good, he told the bad, but he told the truth. And so they went to court. I mean, murderers don't go to court on the morning that they kill somebody. So everything that Daryl said panned out to be true, and he was willing to do anything and everything to prove his innocence, whether it was polygraph, DNA evidence, whatever, you know. But all throughout the years that I knew him, he was always a very gentle soul, yet he evolved. I guess I want to say evolved because I don't, let me just say this, Daryl never really changed. This. A lot of people say, you know, well, if he hadn't been charged with this and locked up in prison, he probably would have been dead. Well, that's just, no, that's not true. Daryl, on a weekly basis before all this happened, he was going by the city uh, employment office because he every week was trying to see what jobs were available. Because like his grandfather, he wanted to work in the streets division. Had Daryl not been charged with this, he would have been retired from the city sitting in a, on the back porch of his house in a rocker uh, with his dog, with his wife, with his kids, and now with, the, with his grandchildren. So this was not, despite what a lot of white people would say to me, this was not a good thing for Daryl. But he did evolve from like a normal, typical citizen into a prophetic voice for so many people who had no voice. 
And when he would speak, if you had the opportunity to hear him, as I know many of you did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was quiet, but true. And he knew who was in his audience. You could see him looking. I saw him speak to third graders in a private school in New York. And I saw him speak to older people. I know Tara, who's on here now and worked with Daryl for many years in the coalition. They went to like even the nursing home to talk about the Racial Justice Act. And he, could, he knew how to talk about implicit bias in, in a way to make people understand it. He was just uh, a wonderful speaker and a wonderful person. And as um, Phoebe has written about in this book, you know, um, I almost said he had a dark side, but that's not true. That the side, the side that we didn't see was the traumatized side. You know, the side that became addicted to pain pills or whatever. I don't really exactly know everything. I know he used some drugs that we didn't know about, but he self-medicated because, you know, there was a lot of trauma. And I know John can talk about this too, because they worked together at the project with other formerly incarcerated individuals who were screwed over and traumatized. But um, we actually got Daryl in to see counselors that were covered by the insurance that he had, but there were limitations on the number of visits. But most significantly, there were limitations on nobody really, on, none, none, of the psych, none of the traditional psychologists understood traumatization of incarcerated people. What Phoebe has written about in her book as moral injury, which is repeated PTSD, repeated over every single day. And Daryl had four years of, of um, segregation, solitary confinement. Some of that he chose because he was trying to save his own life. Mm -hmm. But um, even one day of solitary confinement, one week increases the likelihood of suicide. And of course, that's the official conclusion as to what happened to Daryl was that he did commit suicide. And it's just no, it's just no surprise. I, I feel, I feel, you know, somewhat bad about all that. And, 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 and Reverend Mendez kind of helped me understand that what I was up against in this battle was not just saving one person, but fighting institutions that could really care less about anything other than finality. Hmm. Well, I wonder, Reverend Mendez, if that's a, a segue into kind of talking about the legacy of this period, I was struck by uh, Phoebe's quote on the statistics that I think it went from the prison population in North Carolina went from um, 17,000 to 24,000 or something like that, almost a, almost a 50% increase just in those seven or eight years between the mid 80s and early 90s, that there was this explosion of the prison population and and what we've seen even recently with the exoneration of, um, you know, uh, or not, the, yeah, the exoneration and the, uh, the pardons of these men uh, most recently coming out of this moral panic around child abuse and child uh, uh, of that same period that there was this kind of um, hysteria as a sexist term, I think, so it's not quite right, but the, 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 the kind of panic about it that sent lots of, uh, uh, folks, especially black men, to, to prison at, at this time. So, Ramendez, what what is this period? How does it? How should we be thinking about it? And uh, maybe even how should we be teaching about it? Um, around the around the beginning of Daryl's um, case, I think that um, it's important to realize that Daryl was a case among many cases. And uh, one of the things that Phoebe points out in the book are the numerous uh, individuals, particularly African-American individuals that have been framed and wrongfully incarcerated. Um, that's been going on almost since slavery. And Darrow was a victim of that um, particular system, but we have seen it happen, I've seen it happen over and over and uh, over again. So that the judicial system and the policing of, of, of black communities 
it's always been um, at odds, you know, as such. And black communities are more policed than any other community. Uh, white communities are not um, as policed as African American communities are. And uh, uh, one of the things that um, we know, um, but I think that uh, Phoebe uh, refers to it, how often police officers refer to black folk as niggas. And um, uh, which is a dehumanizing term, but most people of color, even myself as a, as a professional, a minister, um, a therapist, um, if I walk into a supermarket, I'm followed. Um, I mean, I still experience a lot of that. And that's mainly because people of color are considered criminals. We are all considered criminals. And um, um, my own personal experiences, um, um, I've had to fight that, um, you know, repeatedly. So that it's important to understand that um, uh, Darryl, through Daryl, I got involved in uh, 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 dealing with the uh, police. Um, you, you may remember the struggle for a police review board. We were involved in that, um, as well as other struggles um, as it relates to the police, you know, as such. Um, so this system is still pervasive in our country and America has arrested and incarcerated more individuals, particularly people of color, than any other industrial country in the world. We are number one. And it's no accident uh, for that, but it's a way of continuing the oppression. Uh, it, it's a way of trying to keep people of color um, in check. And it doesn't matter really whether or not you're professional or just a street person um, as such, the image that's portrayed of people of color, whether it's on television and the movies, et cetera, uh, you get the feeling we're all criminals, you know, as such. And worse, we're treated that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's uh, also, uh, Dr. Eversley always would tell a story. I can't, I, it might, it's not jumping off the top of my tongue, but in, I think it was 93 or so when y'all started a, a organization around police brutality. And also that, in, in, that some of the largest uh, turnout was of uh, poor and low-income white people from Winston-Salem that responded to that call. Do you remember that uh, organization? Yeah, I organized it. Yeah. People um, uh, uniting for justice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what had happened, there were three incidents that occurred simultaneously. One was uh, the uh, uh, Sheila McCullough, who died in police custody. We had our own local Rodney King uh, beaten uh, by the police. And uh, three white men had um, killed and castrated a black man. Um, which was about to be covered up. I got a call from a police officer who felt like I should know what was going on and how it was being handled. And um, I checked into it and he was telling the, uh, the truth. So um, I called a mass meeting at the church one side was mostly black folk, on the other side was mostly white people, poor working class white people. And out of that, um, we agreed to come together, work, organize and begin um, a campaign for a police review board. Um, and um, that particular experience was literally a microcosm of what Winston looked like. For the first time, 
we actually started working with poor working class white people who to our surprise were being just as uh, as brutalized and um, exploited and oppressed as people of color were. And I said at that particular time that what we have is a race and class problem in Winston-Salem and of course across the country. And we began to treat it that way. And for the first time, we began to work with and fight for a lot of working class white folk, as well as we continue to work with people of color. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, uh, in some of the, we were talking about this on Sunday that, um, you know, what the, the, the strategy of racism may, you know, it targets uh, black people and people of color, uh, but the damage is, is far, you know, reaching that, you know, uh, white people might have a, a much higher life expectancy in the U.S., but even white people as a whole have a much, uh, you know, uh, shorter life expectancy when compared to the rest of the world. We have a much higher infant mortality for white people. We have a, you know, no one arrests and brutalize or there's, you know, police don't murder nearly as many white people uh, anywhere else in the world, except maybe, maybe South Africa, but uh, you know, then how many white people get killed by the police in the U S. And so the system that's based on race uh, you know, has always uh, had a, a, a divide and conquer um, strategy um, to, 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 to try to disrupt exactly what you're talking about, Reverend Mendez, uh, at, that, at, that, uh, at, this, at the very same time, you know, in the early 90s, when we see this uh, surgence of the, of the right and the beginning of the, you know, uh, whole kind of parallel in the schools of the resegregation of our schools beginning in 94 with that school board. In Winston Salem, uh, but Mark, if, could you talk a, a little bit more about um, you know you, you've written about it, and I think have uh, certainly thought a great deal about it about this secondary trauma, about moral injury, and and you know what the because um, it's a community, and so you know Daryl as Reminda says, not just himself, uh, you know he was. Uh, had relationships. Uh, there was other people involved. I mean, even on this call, we can look around and see that Winston Salem is a sleepy town, but it's a it's a community that's divided uh, still, and and certainly uh, was before. Uh, but that there's um, you know there's there is something that uh, has impacted everyone, um, even newcomers to the town. But uh, you could talk a little bit about your you, you alluded to it, uh, talking about some of your conversations with Reverend Mendez after the. Uh, Dale's death, but you could say a little bit more. Yeah, the um, yeah, March thirteenth, two thousand sixteen, was the day that um, they found Daryl's body in the pickup truck across the street from the Coliseum early in the morning. And that night, we Re Reverend Mendez let us have a a gathering at Emmanuel, and I think probably hundred or so people showed up, you know, with very little notice. And afterwards, a few of us ended up downtown, get something to eat. And Reverend Mendez was there and, and um, he instinctively knew what I was, what I was feeling. And I'm sure he was feeling the same thing, you know, that I was blaming myself for not knowing all this stuff. And that's when I first heard about this whole idea, this concept of, of moral injury, uh, which basically means that when our institutions betray us, there's more than just trauma. It's just a whole existential questioning of life, you know? I mean, you could compare it to say um, when in the Catholic Church, which I was raised in, um, you know, with the priest scandals, and of course, other churches have theirs too, but the Catholic Church is, you know, there's just more, so there's, you know, that's a, that's a real betrayal when your priest or minister abuses you, that's, and then the, inst and then the institution magnifies that by covering it up or just moving people to another place, so that's, that's moral injury. Well, moral injury also occurred with Daryl, because 
if you read the book or watch the film or read anything of Daryl's, you see that for the first year, um, Daryl had complete faith in the system. You know, he would not take a plea. He was facing the death penalty. He would not take a plea. Uh, we tried to get him to do that many times when they were offered. But he had this faith that things would be okay. That's why he talked to the police without an attorney early on. He talked to the <coughs> attorney. He turned down the $10,000, you know, the reward money and all that, because he had this faith in, the, in this institution, the, the so-called justice system. So that's one on a grander scale, but you know, those in the circle around Daryl or anybody in this situation, but you know, with Daryl, those of us who worked for him and got to know him, the ministers, the people in the churches that supported him, the lawyers, the investigators, you know, over the years, you know, we kept losing too. And we, I always, and we are, and the lawyers always tried to take a positive sort of attitude. I mean, yeah, I broke my hand on the courthouse door one day when I got a little bit angry and another time put my fist through a closet door. Um, yeah, those things happen, but you know, you uh, try not to be that way uh, because, you know, we have to be the mouthpiece and the so-called reasonable ones, but it'll, it'll screw you up is what I'm trying to say. And witnessing somebody go through this is not the same as the person who goes through it, but our brains interpret it the same way. And so now even the psychological journals write about um, and include indirect trauma, secondary trauma as the same. And I know that that happened to me. I mean, there's just no question about it. I, I, um, I went dark you know, got depressed. Uh, it all got aggravated when Daryl died. Um, I even felt the, you know, suicidal ripples. I'd never been a person who thought about that, but in the weeks after Daryl's death, you know, I found myself in that situation, thinking about it, not acting on it, but, you know, um, we're all affected by this, is what I'm saying. We, as a community, as families, as a society, and it's, it's a documented known phenomenon. And I try to work with law students and lawyers to educate about this particular you know, circumstance that happens in a lot of our cases. And we have to be able to um, let that pass through. We have to, and, and the beginning of it is, is, rec is recognition is that they call it normalization. It's like, yeah, it's normal to experience this. And once you recognize that, then you can sort of take action to let it out, whether it's exercise or meditation or whatever, but, you know, hopefully not drinking substance abuse, violence, which is, you know, those things are always a temptation. Lawyers have a very high rate of you know, substance abuse, alcoholism, but yeah, it's, um, it affects us all, you know, whether it's the, you know, what it does to us as individuals, but more or just as importantly, what it does to us as a society. And a lot of people out there, I mean, I, I know this, that, you know, a lot of people, I mean, they just, it's just not on their radar. People, life is hard, you know? Uh, we've been through a pandemic, which exacerbated everything that we go through on a daily basis. But the people, and I, you know, the people on here I know are aware of these things, but, you know, and, and are concerned, or you, or you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be reading the book, but it's, it's the other people that we need to speak to. And unfortunately, some of those people are actually in power and they take advantage of and use the traumatization to their advantage to maintain power. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, to me, a lot of people ask, and they asked me and Daryl over the years, say after the screening of the case, whether things have changed, you know, haven't things gotten better? Don't, you know, isn't racism gone away or haven't the laws changed? Well, a lot of awareness has come about. There have been a lot of changes in the laws, but um, you know, basic personality and bias structure has really not changed very much. And there are many cases out there now, as we sit here tonight, of people who've been wrongfully convicted and the people in power, the state, the district attorneys, continue to defend a lot of these wrongful convictions. 
And it, it happens repeatedly right here in Winston-Salem. It happened with Daryl's case. It happened in the Calvin Michael Smith case. It ha it's happening in the Merritt Williams Drayton case, a young man wrongfully convicted of a murder in 1985. You know, DNA, there's a DNA match to him, uh, to another guy who's confessed. And yet our district attorney is fighting that. We're going to court in two weeks with the Winston-Salem Five, four of whom are still surviving through this police department, including some of the same officers who wrongfully incarcerated Daryl and you know, following some of the same policies uh, led to false confessions by these 14, 15 year old kids, young black kids in the murder of Nathaniel Jones. And to me, it's all well and good to say we've changed the laws, which we have, but if you let people linger in prison as a result of the past, when we didn't do things this way, then you're just as guilty as ever. And to, to Reverend Mendez's question, why weren't people locked up? Uh, why weren't, why wasn't anybody punished? You know, why didn't the state bars take action? Well, that was, that was the culture, you know, lawyers protecting lawyers, systems protecting systems. It has changed a little bit. I mean, we've seen some prosecutors discipline for some, you know, covering up evidence and that sort of thing, but it still goes on. We, we've started a project at Wake Forest in conjunction with a new nonprofit to try to figure out ways to um, inspire prosecutors to not be that way. But as, as everybody I know is reading about right now in North Carolina, there, you know, there, the murder rates increased last year. And so there's this huge reaction against uh, progressive so-called prosecutors who want to change things and they're blaming new prosecutors. I mean, you know, it's just, it's a fucking game and it's got to stop. I mean, politics has got to be taken out of the equation of justice. Politics has nothing to do, should have nothing to do with justice, but, but it does. Um, I'm getting a little pissed now, so I'm, all the reverends on here have to forgive me. You're covered. You're covered. Um, you have some cursing reverends around somewhere. Uh, but, uh, you wanted know, this, to, go uh, ahead, Reverend. Uh, I wanted to add uh, something that, um, that Mark was uh, talking about and I'll try to make it as short as possible. And that is the trauma among um, people of color begins almost at birth. It's, it's, wow. it's intergenerational, but more importantly, living in the hood, living in the ghetto is traumatizing by itself. I grew up in Harlem. Um, in South Bronx, um, in New York City. And um, I lived with trauma every day. So that Daryl's trauma began as a youth. It became um, bigger, greater um, after his imprisonment as such. But um, the death of his mother, not knowing his mother, um, running through the streets. And I mean, all of that is reflective of trauma. And one of the things about trauma that we should uh, recognize, um, Stolaro, a psychoanalyst, defines trauma as unbearable affect. And mm. um, he also talks about um, if you had trauma in the beginning, all the other trauma that follows it only activates or reactivates that earlier trauma. Mm -hmm. And trauma lives with you all of your life. Reading the book and reliving that experience, I had no idea that how much I was still traumatized by that whole experience, but also my own experiences as such. So that, and one of the things about trauma um, is that um, behavior wise, it drives you to do some really crazy things that you would not ordinarily do. And it's the unconscious aspects of trauma uh, that continues to affect us 
uh, more and more. And I watched Daryl and I tried my best to get him to come. We talked a few times, but I, I was afraid. And I used to tell him all the time that he was more hurt and damaged than he could ever realize. But his response was, I'm okay, I'm mm -hmm. okay. He thought he was okay. But I was watching slowly um, some degeneration. My own term is disintegration uh, mm -hmm. beginning to occur. I didn't know to the extent of how far uh, that disintegration in terms of the loss of self um, had taken place. But that's what trauma does to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I know we're going to get some some audience questions here in a minute. Uh, uh, you know that that trauma, and we certainly know it begins before birth. Uh, that you know they've shown over and over again that uh, the highest income black women have a higher infant mortality rate than lowest income white women. That you know black women with PhDs have a higher uh, infant mortality, maternal morbidity rate than white women who have just graduated high school. So this. Uh, certainly, um, uh, this trauma piece that Dr. Mendez, who's um, uh, uh, is bringing to us, is deep. I, from my own to place myself in it, uh, which I was asked to do. You know, I came and met Daryl in person on uh, December 27th of 2003, um, walking up to Delbrook Church as he got out, and certainly saw what many have seen as that that soft. Uh, voice his first thing was to ask forgiveness and for us to pray for uh deborah sykes and uh uh and for her mother evelyn and um uh you know he certainly had that he certainly had a mischievous side to him too uh which was you know fun and uh, and and all that uh but i i remember bringing a, a uh, bringing this up to a, at a panel in um where reverend nelson johnson was and he, uh a couple years later and I, you know, said, you know, when after this in 2004, 2005, I went to these events and it seemed like all the white people were talking about healing, that we need to heal. And I was, you know, a little, uh, you know, confused and uh, certainly self-righteous enough as a whatever, 18 year old or 16 year old to say, well, what are you healing from? You know, it wasn't your kids that were gunned down the street by police. It's not your kids who are who are in the uh, jails right now at, at these rates. You know what? Why are you talking about, it seems like you're really just prescribing healing for someone else, uh, for that black people need to heal so that, you know, they uh, don't have to feel guilty about it anymore. And what Reverend uh, Johnson of Greensboro said, let me push you brother in a kind way and said, for a person to have a wound that they don't know they have is a dangerous person. Uh, a group of people to have a wound that they have and they don't know they have it is a dangerous group of people. For a, a nation or a people to have a wound, uh, uh, that they don't know they have is terrifying, but for a, a people with uh, the most systemic uh, and international power in the history of the planet to have a wound and not know they have it is catastrophic. And I think that catastrophe of white people not knowing the wound that has happened um, has been part of that uh, re re perpetuation of the crime uh, of, of, you know, is as uh, uh, James Baldwin says, that innocence is the crime. That, that you know, this idea of us being innocent is is actually the crime that we haven't been um, you know implicated in it. And uh, and so you know, coming uh, it, the terms not in some as as Mark says, you don't equi equivalent or you know make them equivalent by any stretch. But in movements certainly and in partnerships, if this is only about the harm that's been happening to Black people, there's by nature going to be a power imbalance. Uh, if it's not seen as what, you know, what has, you know, why it can't be, uh, you know, you just can't say it's a coincidence anymore that uh, we're almost surprised that it's not when it's not a white male who commits, a, a, you know, a school violence or mass shootings, uh, you know, that what, what has gone on, especially in particular with white men and the, you know, the way that we have been socialized um, and as a part of this moral, moral harm and um, or moral injury. Uh, that we've um, experienced and that certainly not not also either to be uh, I'm not getting all my words um, trying another bottom quote but um, but yeah so that, that that's also kind of what I've uh, 
continually struggle with is coming to terms with what is this, uh, what's the, you know, uh, you know, what happens to a people uh, who have perpetuated, uh, you know, genocide, uh, enslavement, rape, murder on a scale that has not been seen before in the planet, um, that something has to happen to us. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's a question that I uh, often ask and struggle with in, in terms of this discussion on, on trauma too. Um, I don't know if y'all, if, if, if did, Mark or John did, or Mendez, did you want to say anything before we hop into some questions, if there are any from the from the audience? I'll let Mark go first. I, I do have something else to say, but go ahead. I, I'll just say one thing briefly, and you know, I, I don't want to make it all horrible and tragic. I, I do want to, we're talking about Daryl. There, there was never anything more infectious than his laugh. I mean, when he laughed, it was like, man, the room laughed. And he, he had a great sense of humor and a, a lot of resilience in spite of what happened to him. And, you know, we've talked a lot about trauma and there's that book, The Body Keeps the Score. And we do store yeah. our trauma, you know, in our bodies. But I, I, I went away last week for a week at a um, meditation place um, this this buddhist place i go to frequently uh hadn't been able to go because of the pandemic but what i rediscovered there is uh you know we don't just hold our trauma in our bodies but we hide our wisdom and we hide our joy and mm -hmm. you know there is there is an out you know there is an out and we have to remember that and my people that are close to me are constantly reminding me of that because i i do have a tendency towards you know, being, you know, dark about things, but, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of great stuff. And those of us who continue to do this work, and I don't know how much longer I can do it. It seems like I have a few more years, but, you know, John, you know what I'm talking about, Rob, you're, you're about a third of the way there, but, you know, to sustain ourselves, we have to see that there is this joy and there is this wisdom. And there are people that need us to hold their hand as they walk through this, whether it's medical treatment or whether it's um you know uh the, the the criminal system we need to accompany people there's that uh doctor who just passed away recently and that was his philosophy accompaniment you know i'm there with you no matter what it's not winning it's not losing it's that i am there with you whether it's the good or whether it's the bad and i think that'll keep us going because we we can't let anger be the driving force i mean i, I have a tendency towards being angry but you know what is it they say the the if the legs of the table are anger then that table's not going to stand too long and anger you will burn out with anger it is a fire so you have to we do have to find the joy in each other and the inspiration and daryl certainly you know was that for me yeah mm -hmm. two quick two quick uh responses one is that um the ghetto, the hood, is defined by the psychologist Kenneth Clark as a colony, and you and it's important to recognize oppression as being associated with colonization, mm -hmm. so that the whole experience through life is one of trauma. The second piece is um, it's important to distinguish. Um, and, 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 and I just, and I heard what you're saying, Mark, and I read your paper, and I think you're on target. Um, but also there's a thing called assertive aggression or assertive anger that's necessary for us to stay in the struggle for justice, to, put, um, to, to, to move towards social, political, and economic transformation over against the kind of narcissistic aggression that we experience as a result of, to go back to that term, um, uh, injury. And um, there's a kind of existential injury that we experience in, t um, in terms of an unresponsive, unempathic, oppressive environment. Uh, 
and um, I'm actually writing about a lot of this in a book um, dealing with uh, of self psychology and uh, the African American experience. And one of the things that um, contemporary psychoanalysis focuses on is an un um, is the fact that those injuries uh, cause, um, on the one hand, narcissistic rage, uh, which is a danger to the self over against some of us like Malcolm X and many others move towards, and Dr. King, assertive anger uh, that's so necessary to bring about social change. So um, from a psychoanalytic uh, perspective, yeah, we are a people in need of healing, um, mm -hmm. but that healing cannot be about um, uh, making us adjust, adapt, and accommodate the system. Mm -hmm. But in fact, healing that's necessary uh, to move us from being against ourselves to being for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I like to put a pen right there. Mm -hmm. So Rob, why don't I, um, at the risk of, of interrupting the this, this fascinating thread of conversation. Uh, um, we do have some questions uh, and comments um, uh, coming in, and, and uh, I'll, um, I'll try to be uh, true to those and, and voice a, a few of them and, and see, see, where we, um, see where we can get. Thanks to, the, um, thanks to the three of you for bringing us this far already. And um, I want to assure folks also out in the audience that if you're, if you're sending, you're sending some very, very um, um, thoughtful and, and in some cases, sweet comments to the panelists, and while they aren't getting them necessarily through the through the chat bar, I will make sure that they um, that they see the things that you you've shared and all the questions you've asked, even if if we don't have time to get to everything this evening. Um, I, I'll I'll go to um, one of the uh, one one question, um, which is um, I, wondering if if um, somebody's wondering if if one or or more of you could. Uh, say a little bit more about um, about an individual who's been referenced several times here, but uh, but of course uh, because of his um, early passing, um, I couldn't be at an event like this. And that's the late Reverend um, uh, uh, Eversley, and um, I wonder wonder if, um, if, if Rob, I know he was he was your pastor, but also um, but also. Uh, Every, everybody on the panel knows. Uh, could you say a, a word or two about him and his and his uh, his intersection with Daryl's story and his legacy in this community? I'll 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 I'll, I'll defer to those who uh, knew him knew him longer, but um, he was he's he's very special. Yeah, Dr. Eversley um, had a memory like an elephant. He remembered facts, he remembered um, events, et cetera. And uh, there wasn't a more committed, uh, genuine um, minister and pastor in this city uh, more than Dr. Eversley. I think about him, I miss him every day. Everything that we've been able to achieve in this community and in this uh, state um, we basically did it together. Also missing in, in, in that um, uh, fellowship, of course, it was Reverend Fails um, as well, who and both of them passed um, too early. And um, um, I missed them tremendously. But whatever has been achieved, believe me, Dr. Eversley and Reverend Fails, um, played a major role in um, those in bringing about those changes. And I just I just want to add too that you know um, throughout the years, the many decades of Daryl's case, the the team was not just the lawyers, it was the ministers and the activists, and we got to be pretty close. And I think it's fair to say, because I think we laughed about it at certain times, sometimes the lawyers had to save the faith of the ministers 
And sometimes the ministers <laughs> had to save the faith of the lawyers in the system. And uh, I remember talking, trying to talk you and Eversley and John into uh, not going and having a sit-in at the DA's office. And, uh, <laughs> but there was a lot, there were a lot of times like that. And um, with Larry and Carlton and you and, and I and others, it, we were, we changed a lot, but we kept each other going through a lot of, a lot of stuff. Of course, one of the greatest scenes, I think, in the film is when you got kicked out of the courtroom. <laughs> that was like classic. I don't even think you remember that until you saw the film. Yeah. But, you know. yeah. yeah I, I'll tell you, Dr. Eversley remembered it. Uh, just like remembered everything. He, he talks about it. I got, for those who are interested, I did a, got a chance to do oral history with Dr. Eversley and with Reverend Mendez that's at the UNC um, Southern Oral History Program that's available uh, publicly if you're if you're interested, but Dr. Eversley, I was, you know, 16, as soon as my, my, my dad brought me over on one Sunday, and then when I got my license, I started coming back uh, across town, and he would spend, to join Delabrook, you had to do an eight-week college-level course uh, that included, uh, <laughs> uh, that included uh, Black and Presbyterian by uh, Gayrod uh, Wilmore, uh, and uh, Disciplines of the Spirit by Howard Thurman, and so when I showed up at, at UNC, uh, uh, that people were very confused how I knew about those two writers uh, <laughs> coming from Winston-Salem suburbia. But um, he, 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 his heart was just so huge. Uh, he, and uh, he just had mind and, and uh, mind and soul that, um, and, and, and had courage that uh, I just, uh, I, I know I wouldn't be able to, uh, speak in the ways that I speak or, or, or be in this place that I am without um, what he offered to me as a young person and, uh, and uh, as, a, as, his, uh, as my pastor. Thank you for that. Um, a question, another question, um, uh, sort of several different categories of questions. I'm going to try to, try to work through them in an orderly way. Um, when, one audience member has asked, and this is something that as, as folks move further into the book, they're going to, I think, learn more about from the book. But, um, but this evening, if, um, there's a request uh, to maybe say a little bit more about the Daryl Hunt, the Daryl Hunt Project for Freedom and Justice. Um, okay. Could one of you say more about that? I've worked with Daryl uh, um, in, in the Freedom and Justice Project. I did the counseling for him and I volunteered uh, to do it, but uh, that was an amazing program. And I think um, Phoebe, you know, zeroed in on it, you know, correctly in terms of what it did for others. And this is where Darrow, Darrow's heart was, um, helping others similar in similar situations um, like what he experienced, but also he understood the challenges uh, that uh, he used to call them the homecomers would experience once they got out of prison and um, integrated back into um, the, the life in the city as such. And he wanted to make their burdens a lot uh, lighter. Um, and it was an excellent program. He used to amaze me in terms of how he was able to get jobs for so many of the uh, homecomers. And he paid special attention to all of them. When I got him um, in the, uh, and we have, I, I organized what was a group counseling um, at the time where we often shared and talked about, uh, but one of the things that still bothers me is the fact that so much of social services failed a lot of these young people. It, I mean, it was clear um, in terms of some of the horrors that they were living through, whether it was in the family or whatever, and there was no real response to any. You could see a crime happening long before it happened. Mm -hmm. I intervened one time with two young people 
who were about to kill, they had a plan to kill their mother's boyfriends. And it was through those experiences that I realized that the young people just were not angry at their fathers, but in fact, at their mothers. And I began to understand why in a lot of the uh, rap lyrics, um, they referred to women as bitches, but it was not inseparable from how so many young men, especially, were feeling about their mothers, feeling left out, feeling neglected, um, experiencing deprivation, all of that. And it um, created this narcissistic rage that I was talking about earlier, where they wanted to right or wrong or engage in some kind of revenge in terms of what was uh, happening to them. But the project was the salvation for a lot of young people and adults who were coming out of prison and needed assistance, needed help and support to become integrated back into society. And I would reference Phoebe's book because she really does a good job explaining what that project was all about and how it helped so many people. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, a couple, I guess, I guess a couple of questions. Um, well, actually the, the next one is, um, there are two questions that come in. One, uh, an early question came in, were Tisdale and Dalton and others ever charged with a cover-up? And, and um, that, again, probably a question that gets answered later later in the book, but but in the context of this evening, um, I appreciate somebody um, uh, somebody uh, shedding some light on, on who that who Tisdale and Dalton were and, and, and um, whether there was accountability. And then related to that, a question came in, um, would it be possible for um, uh, for Mark or or others, obviously, to talk about the prosecutor's accountability project? Many of these, the, and the the question asker continued. Many of these wrongful convictions are the byproduct of white collar crime committed by prosecutors. Yeah. So uh, Don Tisdale was the elected district attorney here in Forsyth County at the time of Daryl's case, and. We now know and we found out with really within the couple of years that he had actually written a letter to the chief of police saying that contrary to what has been stated publicly, we do not have a solid prosecution of any kind. Basically, it was an admission of an unethical prosecution and probably, you know, illegal. And other former district attorney office told me later that one of the running jokes was that in, anybody can convict a guilty person. It takes a really good prosecutor to convict an innocent person. So that, that was the mindset. And uh, I think that's mostly changed uh, in terms of whether people are going to say that overtly, but you know, there's still a gamesmanship as I was talking about earlier. Uh, Detective Dalton was a juvenile detective. He, he dealt with cases with minors and got assigned to this missing person report when they first reported Deborah Sykes was missing. And it was almost like, I, I don't know that anybody would ever admit this, or maybe Phoebe, I don't think has a necessarily has an answer to this, but it was almost like they, they just, it was like a joke that they assigned Dalton to this case because they were, the right. police department was already pissed that, um, you know, the, the newspaper, editor or publisher was calling down there saying, look, you need to look for her. And they were like, well, you know, maybe something happened domestically or wait 24 hours or whatever. But they, but they left Dalton in charge of this investigation. And we know from their written policies that, you know, you don't leave a juvenile uh, detective in charge of a homicide investigation. But what they did uh, later was they, you know, Dalton was made the scapegoat in the case initially. And he was uh, basically had his um, badge taken and he had to become a radio dispatcher. And the last time I saw him before he died was uh, he was working security at Walmart or something. And, um, but he was scapegoated. Uh, everybody else just got a reprimand. And the city manager came down on the police department for letting the district attorney lead, lead them by the nose in the investigation. But, you know, Dalton had no other choice because um, he was made in charge of it. 
So um, what we're doing with the prosecution accountability project, it actually was the idea of Brian Stevenson, who um, one of the, the funders of the project asked Brian what would be good and to, to do, you know, and this happened after all the George Floyd awareness came about. And, you know, fortunately, this guy wanted to direct his money somewhere. And Brian suggested that he look into the abolition of prosecutorial immunity. What that means is prosecutors can't be sued for violating people's rights. They can't be sued civilly. Um, police officers can. They have limited circumstances in which you can sue the police, but prosecutors can't. So that's where that's the origin of our project. But we're looking into across the nation whether state bars actually do anything to prosecutors for hiding evidence or you know, pursuing wrongful convictions, and even the question of defending um, wrongful convictions, that is resisting the exonerations of people. And there's a, you know, there's a real backlash, especially in North Carolina right now, a big backlash among prosecutors because they don't want any more people exonerated. So, so that's what's going on with that. Um, another, another question, and, I, and as I ask this, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm very aware that uh, my background image on Zoom tonight is uh, the landscape of 1890s Winston-Salem, but, but sort of the, the territory, as I understand it, um, where, um, where uh, Deborah Sykes was found is, is, is represented sort of in the area just, uh, just, uh, just east of the, the West End, which is right under the logo, the logo behind me. The, this question is actually about physical geography and our understanding of it. Um, the, the, the question reads, the first call to the police about the murder was misunderstood by the 911 operators. And Zerwick talks about how the caller and the operator had different quote unquote physical geography references. And the question is how much of the injustices in, in, um, in Daryl's case were the result of um, what the question asker uh, refers to as passive misunderstandings of the landscapes um, that we experience differently in our communities. Um, Mark, may maybe that's a question for you, uh, uh, considering your detailed mastery of all the evidence. Well, I guess that was yeah, maybe a passive misunderstanding about geography for that initial phone call, because if the if the they actually sound like, I think there were two dispatchers who answered got on the call and they just misunderstood what the person was saying, um, sent the car to the wrong place. It would not have saved Deborah Sykes because she was dead within minutes. But in terms of um, racism, um, you know, there, there, there was systemic racism from the get-go and there was individual racism. Uh, you know, we talk about it in two different ways. You know, certain people are, you know, they're just racist, but then there are these systems of racism that are embedded you know, from the beginning, like, I mean, for the United States, that would, you would start with the constitution, you know, <laughs> when <laughs> black people or, or slaves were not even fully human, of course, neither were women. Um, so, you know, it, it starts there and carries all the way through, you know, uh, real estate, um, what is it, uh, redlining, letting people live only in certain districts and all that. But, but in this case, you know, the the police officers admitted that every, or I think Detective Dalton testified in the case that every black male in Winston-Salem was a suspect in this case. Um, I mean, what else do you need to say, you know? And what Chief Police Chief Maston said, oh, our goal was to make an arrest and we made an arrest. And then when uh, Willard Brown, the real killer in the, in the Sykes case, uh, raped somebody else, you know, the, the police were just really upset because it made it look like they got the wrong black guy. And at that point, the case became not only about Daryl, but it became as much about Larry Little and the ministers, you know, the so-called black ministers, proving them wrong as much as it was, you know, prosecuting the case. So it was, there was race from the get-go, you know, and all the way through, and, and that thread continues to this day. And, you know, re re remind, so John, when, when you're warning me not to let go of my anger, I mean, don't, don't, don't. I'm pretty fucking pissed <laughs> still, so don't worry about right. it. I, I'd like to, to talk myself off the ledge, you know, repeatedly. So I'm, I'm talking to my, I'm preaching to my choir here about suppressing anger. Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, when you see that kind of racism and it continues and it continues and it continues. And I, you know, I could sugarcoat it if I wanted to. 
Um, but I'm not going to because it's there. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll just say real quick because yeah, right. that um, you know the in, in many ways you know our discussion, especially since George Floyd, about you know we've added this adjective systemic racism to racism. When in many ways that's you know a redundant term, systemic racism. You know that's that's just what racism is. It, you, we could send it as REI often says we could send every outright bigot to the moon uh, tomorrow, and it, we might need a couple, a lot of ships to do it, but uh, it, it wouldn't. It would do nothing to impact our systems because that's actually the most convenient place uh, to place our anxiety about racism is especially on uh, you know poor and. Uh, we have this, uh, we, we um, overestimate the racism of poor white people and underestimate the racism of so-called liberal, nice white people, uh, which gets us in trouble uh, all the time. And so, you know, that, you know, these systems certainly, as Mark said, it, there's the argument even to this day, we could go take us off on another track, you know, that there's no such thing as, any, as de facto uh, segregation that actually de jure, it, it's all it all comes from laws. I mean, so it's, it's not like it's, it's an accident, you know, that, you know, where kids are going to school, it's not an accident, even if it's not explicitly written, if it was once explicitly written, uh, then to try to fix it with a race neutral solution is, is just to perpetuate racism. Um, so uh, just a few little, a few thoughts on that one. Yeah, thanks. So I'm, I'm watching the, the time and, and want to be, um, I want to try to hold to our promise to let folks get on with their evenings in, in just a few minutes. Um, but but I, I guess I'd like to ask uh, the, all three of you um, uh, before, before we wrap, uh, and I'll just make a few comments after that, uh, just uh, housekeeping comments. Um, uh, would, would each of you like to offer just a, a, a final comment, um, reflecting back on the discussion tonight or or a thought about uh, Phoebe's book, or about um, uh, and and uh, uh, maybe a, a pep talk for uh, the rest of us who are looking forward to. Uh, who, some of us may be deciding whether or not to read the whole book or not. Um, uh, any final, uh, any any uh, final comments um, for this evening from the three panelists? Maybe um, Reverend Mendez, if you want to, if you want to start. Could I, could I actually uh, step in uh, and uh, be um, arrogant enough to do that? And because I'd, I'd rather I don't have the last words, which sometimes ends up when I'm the uh, I want my elders to have the last word, and and I, I call them elders because you know uh, Mark he's not as elder, but uh, not everyone who's old is an elder. Uh, there's some people who are just olders. Uh, and uh, so these are, uh, as you can see, the passion and the commitment of uh, that they have evolved. And, uh, and it, there's um, not everyone is able to do that. And not everyone is able to still connect in the ways that uh, these two um, freedom fighters have is to continue to connect, continue to invest in young people um, and stay in it. Um, and, you know, really, from a deep love, uh, a place of love for, uh, for God's people. Uh, so my, my uh, you know, uh, Daryl a, a, is a special human being to many of us. Uh, I miss him and I miss Dr. Eversley uh, every day. Um, and he speaks to us. They all are still uh, with us. And I, I hope that Reverend Mendez can, can uh, you know, talk a little bit about the uh, making sense of this uh, uh, you know, what is not sensible, that makes no sense in this world this, the, of, of Black suffering, of the reality we, we live in and the systems we live in. I've, I've uh, talked with Dr. Mendez a lot about dialectics and I've had my kind of uh, layman's dialectics that I use to make some sense of it. It started with Al McShirley, who's a, a civil rights attorney here in North Carolina, um, always saying, is it race or class? The answer is yes, yes it is. Uh, and building out that is, you know, is, is uh, racism harmful or beneficial to white people? The answer is yes. Yes, it is. Uh, is, uh, you know, do we need to change systems and institutions or do we need to change hearts and minds and culture? Yes, yes, we, we need to do that. Uh, and, you know, is this change happen suddenly uh, all at once or slowly, slowly over time? And I think this case certainly uh, uh, answers that with a resounding yes. That's exactly how systemic change happens. It's slowly, slowly, and then sometimes there's avalanches. And then finally, what I've thought about tonight is that, you know, uh, is it true that hurt people hurt people 
I mean, does trauma make, bro you know, the, uh, there's something really true about a broken heart. You know, it doesn't work as well sometimes. You know, bro being broken hearted can, can make people mean and hurt people, hurt people is true. And then also, uh, is it also true that, uh, you know, wounded healers are the only kind. That this is, as Mark has touched, you know, that the places where those, that harm has happened is also our deepest wells of empathy. Uh, and love and capacity to, uh, you know, work with folks and be with people and create a community uh, that uh, can uh, counter this. And I have to just, I was meant to, I said something about Reverend McCutcheon, but I said Dr. Eversley that Reverend McCutcheon often was mentioned as Dr. Eversley's best white friend. Uh, uh, and he, he said, I love you dearly, but I'll get, pass it on from there. Well, I'm not the oldest elder. So I'll go next, so read this book, read the yes. whole book. Um, I am so glad that Phoebe wrote this book because I tried to write, I tried to write a book and I just fell into a hole, man. So I gave Phoebe everything that I wrote. And, and also I know, and I, Phoebe would say this as well. Thanks to, um, Mike's wife, Leslie, who's on here, who is the archivist of the Daryl Hunt archive at the, that we keep at the law school, basically Daryl and I and others saved everything and gave all of that. Um, like, I don't know, 70, 80 boxes of files and letters and journals donated all that to the library. And Leslie, I think, probably knows more about the case than anybody right now. But we were able to let Phoebe use that. And she cites it a lot in the book. And it's a real, it's a very important tool um, for researchers, for students, but it's a living archive, you know, and we're, we'll be talking more about this in the fall as we add more to the archive about the cases that are carrying on Daryl's memory and be, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm calling on the archive to help me in the case we're going to court on in a few weeks with the Winston-Salem five, uh, the innocence commission of North Carolina, which was started because of Daryl's case has come and looked at the archive for records that are not anywhere else. So, you know, we're trying the intent that, Daryl and I had putting all this together and giving it to the library has more than been carried out by Leslie and the, and the ZSR library and the law school um, so that projects like Phoebe's book can go forward and we can learn from the mistakes of, of the past because they're not the past. Yeah, um, I have focused um over these years in terms of lessons that we can learn from Daryl Hunt um and um I think it's important to recognize how Daryl got into this situation in the first place um that's why I, I talked a lot about the environment um, understanding what it means to live in a colonized uh, situation as such. Um, but what, um, when I mentioned that we are uh, a community in need of healing, um, that's what I dedicated my life to. I organized mind site counseling services, um, but I have larger projects that I would love to do. Um, the COVID inter interrupted a lot of it, but um, how do we organize our community to heal? And um, how does that happen? How does that uh, take place? Um, I, th I see that as the greatest need uh, facing us right now from the youth, children to youth, uh, even to adults as such. And um, my experience with Daryl uh, throughout all those years, we were in fact trying to um, 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 address. This is what he wanted uh, to address. And, um, and I see for me the beginning um, is oppression. It's the fundamental starting point of oppression and um, our society focuses on blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Mark 
you know, really said it best that this is systemic. Um, it's not a matter of blaming the victims, but uh, Daryl, uh, we see him all the time. Other Daryls that uh, come about um, who are often victimized in similar ways. Um, that's what I'm interested in now that I've retired after 36 years of being uh, pastor in the Emmanuel uh, Baptist Church. Um, but we need more ministers uh, to get involved. Um, I'm interested in developing a uh, ministerial pastoral counseling program. Um, my, where I went uh, for training, they're interested in working with us um, as well. But we have to organize ourselves to heal, organize ourselves to really bring about fundamental change. It's not going to happen by itself. That assertive anger that I talked about, yes, I'm angry. I'm still angry. And, uh, but I want to use that anger uh, to motivate me and others to do some constructive things that's going to bring about fundamental change. Well, well thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll move this to, toward a, a finish. Um, and I, I would, before thanking our, our panelists, I, I would just, I'd just take a moment to say, you know, we, that one of the, obviously one of the dominant themes in tonight's conversation has been on the, the theme of, of trauma, um, the trauma that, that continues to ripple um, uh, out from um, your personal experiences uh, with Daryl and, um, and, uh, you know, I, I just want to, I, I just want to note too that for, for all three of you, I guess this is the beginning of my thank you. I really thank you for uh, being willing to to take part in a conversation like this because I know you've you've been doing, you've been talking about this story for a long, long time and living with it for a long, long time. And I don't take for granted that it is difficult every time you revisit it. Um, and. And so it's a it's a great gift to us to um, to hear from you and for you to take this time with uh, sharing a, a story that's not easy uh, to to revisit, um, you know just just to put a, a put a, a a tag on that. Uh, I'm aware or, too for re, you know for folks who are reading this book for the first if they're, whether they're familiar with the story or not that um, that the reading of the story itself um, can bring pain. And um, I, in fact, I know I know one uh, I know of one good friend to to the museum um, who I know is very pleased that we're having events like this, but isn't couldn't join tonight because uh, this individual just shared with us that it was uh, just too painful. Um, somebody who, who lived in some proximity to this uh, to this story. So thank you to the three of you and to the entire audience for um, for uh, being part of this. Uh, of this conversation and hopefully we'll continue to see you through the rest of the series. Um, I want to uh, really heartfelt thanks to, uh, to Reverend Stevens and Reverend Mendez and uh, Mark Rabel for um, bringing us through this first of four uh, events in the community read. Um, y'all are all, uh, all of our audiences on our email list. So you're going to continue to get reminders about upcoming events. I also want to just um, just put a, a bug in your ear about um, a, an addition to this series that um, we're still we're still finalizing the details on, but we're keenly aware that some of you would probably uh, have loved to and would might might really love to uh, you know just uh, take this book in hand and get in the car and come somewhere and sit together and talk about the book and and these Zoom events aren't necessarily going to be you know the perfect opportunity for that and so we're we're putting um, we're actually in the process of putting together a um, a, a few opportunities um, for folks to gather if they like um, in an in-person setting at, um, at one or more um, uh, library uh, locations uh, in Winston-Salem. Um, and so since you're on our email list, you'll get some, um, you'll get some information about that soon. And um, if anybody you know, decides they want, they'd like to do that, we would love to, um, to see you and uh, and, and talk about the book, I guess, in a little more of a familiar book club, book club, book club kind of way. So stay tuned on that. Um, and two weeks from today is the is event number two with um, T. Dion Bailey from Colgate University uh, and uh, Tara Callahan. 
And um, with that, I will um, th again thank our panelists and all of you for being here. And we'll see you soon. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you.